gadget mad. Gadget mad. Right. Good morning. Let us. Um, I'm again not speaking from a specific text. I'm speaking from lots of texts because it's uh, the subject of the work of the Spirit. But I give you one verse to begin with, which we'll also conclude with. In one John four and verse thirteen. One John four verse thirteen. It says, um, one John four and verse thirteen. Hereby know we that we dwell in Him and He in us, because He hath given us of His Spirit. He hath given us of His Spirit. Uh, our subject of the Holy Spirit is, a, is, is uh, you could say in some ways a simple subject, in others a vast subject, but certainly uh, it's not my intention to speak about everything, uh, which is a relief, I'm sure. But uh, um, at the same time, the subject particularly to deal with is the Holy Spirit's miracle of the Christian. The Holy Spirit's miracle of the Christian. Mm-hmm. And our text, this text, hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit, written by the Apostle John, who previously heard the words of Christ in John 14, verse 26, the comfort of the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. And bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said to you. They were promised, the disciples were promised, that all the word of Christ would be brought to their remembrance. From that night, when Jesus said that, the night in which he was betrayed, when they were troubled and weak, they were then given, and then John, now later writing in 1 John chapter 4, that we know that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us his spirit. He kept his promise. He gave them the spirit that they promised and they were changed. Now the indwelling of the spirit, two points I want to make at some length. Firstly, the, that the indwelling of the spirit is entirely miraculously the work of God and a great and glorious miracle. And secondly, how that we live in the spirit. Now there's many verses we could turn to but to, to show the indwelling of the spirit is a wonderful miraculous work that uh, first of all uh, four proofs of this you can come to you can come to many many more of them I'm sure that first um, Corinthians chapter 2 first Corinthians in chapter 2 and verse 9 but as it is written I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath, hath prepared to them that love him. It hasn't even come into anyone's mind or thought. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. This then the natural man doesn't receive the things of God. The Spirit is miraculously given by our glorious God. In verse 11, Paul continues, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. See, this is miraculous. It's marvellous. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also uh, we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And uh, verse 14, the natural man, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who hath known the mind of the Lord? 
that he may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. This is the gift, the Spirit of God, that not naturally received, miraculously. You see, who, who could claim to have the mind of Christ? It would be impossible. It's only because the Spirit has been miraculously given to the people of God. So having the Spirit is a, is a miracle, because the natural man receiveth not the things of God. If you become a Christian, it's a work of God. And secondly, the indwelling of the Spirit is miraculous because Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. I will pray the Father, John 14, 16, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. It's the promise of Christ to, to send even the Spirit of truth. Just note very briefly, another comforter, another of the same kind, not something else, but like Christ, mm -hmm. a divine person, the neuter spirit is called he. So, so the, 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 word, the grammar is changed to, to, to make sure that the spirit is known as he, not it. So it, it may be used as well because the spirit is neuter, but he, the divine person, another comforter, we may say Emmanuel, God with us, just as Christ is Emmanuel, God with us. So the indwelling of the Spirit, miraculous, because the natural man receiveth not the things of God, and because Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. And thirdly, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is miraculous, because we're asked to pray for the Holy Spirit, to pray. If he, ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, Luke 11, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? That ask him. We only pray for miracles. We don't pray for things that we can do. Well, in a way, we pray for all very ordinary things, but it's all miraculously given by God. And the Spirit is miraculously given by God because the natural man can't receive him. Jesus Christ sends him and the, uh, it, we're to pray for him. And fourthly, having the Spirit in us is a miracle because the coming of the Holy Spirit was given by sovereign grace, the gift of God. The Spirit bloweth where he listeth. I'm speaking to you in... Uh, Great and glorious things. We're going to come down to the, to, the, to the sort of application of it in a while. John 3, verse 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell where it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. See, it's not just that someone says, well, you just open your mouth and go, blah, 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 and you'll be speaking in tongues, and you'll have to speak. Not like that. It's a, it's a wonder of God. Much the reformed teaching of the Holy Spirit is higher, a thousand times higher than the charismatic and the Pentecostal. Amen. Because it's a miracle of God, it's not man's doings. Mm. And you, to summarise this miracle in Ephesians chapter 2, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked, according to the course of this, dead in sins, According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others dead, children of wrath. But God, who is rich in mercy, with his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together. How do you quicken someone, bring them to life who's dead in sins, but by the miraculous giving of the Holy Spirit of God, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus for by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves it is the gift of God 
not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Uh, some people like to try to pick out that somewhere in there there's some of that that's not of grace. It's only, what is it, the, the, the a part of it. Uh, I can't remember which verse they take now. Grace you say, it's not of yourself. Oh, they say, it's only grace that's not of yourself. Oh, faith is of yourself, but grace isn't. Nonsense. Nonsense. So the great miracle of the new birth, the work of the, of the Spirit of God, all this miracle of having the Holy Spirit has all come from God to be with us and in us. I remember I was saved when I heard... A, a, a sermon on Ephesians 2 but what came over particularly was he bare our own sins in his body on the tree from First Peter and it was strange because there was no appeal look unto Christ and you'll be saved none of that Christ was just preached it was as if as Paul says to the Galatians he was crucified before my eyes mm. I didn't see anything I took others to church. They never make any difference to them. It was the Spirit of God. It was the Spirit of God. So the indwelling of the Spirit that we believe we have as Christians is not visible. Sometimes it's not felt. It's miraculous because the natural man doesn't receive it. Jesus sends the Spirit. We're to pray for the Spirit and because the Holy Spirit is given by this sovereign grace of God. So having the Holy Spirit is a miraculous work. Now the implications of us, the implications, wonderful, vast. And just to issue a short warning at the beginning, which I think we maybe have said already in one of the other little addresses. The Christian is commanded to be holy. No doubt this is your chief aim in life. However, a terrible temptation of the devil is for us to believe that we can improve our sinful nature. We can imp I'm going to be really... Mm. But this is the chief error of non-evangelical religion, whether Christian, so-called or otherwise. We cannot save the old man. We're to crucify the old man. And we need the spirit. You see, we're still ourselves. We're still ourselves. But we don't, as it were, improve ourselves. We, it's the Spirit of God in us. And it's all to the glory of God. And it's from God. Now, so, let's look at the implications of this miracle of a human being having God in us by the Spirit of God. How may a Christian live with the Holy Spirit? It involves huge responsibilities and we need all the help that we can get. Of course, he, he is our help. Now, the first aspect, I've got, I think I've got five here. So we're in the second part now, so we're going pretty fast. <laughs> we live with the Holy Spirit in awe. This is the first point. We live in awe. Yes. If God is with us, he be our friend and dwell with us and among us. We're on holy ground. The indwelling of the Spirit then is not the awe of the razzmatazz of the crazy, it's unfair to call them crazy churches, isn't it? Or the Quakers waiting. But the Christian having the Holy Spirit with him, this great miracle of God, to have received the greatest miracle of all, is an extraordinary privilege. That we are we're dead to the world. We're now seated in heaven with Christ. I know there's a coming, there's a coming of Christ. I'm not denying, I'm not denying the return of Christ. We long for the return of Christ soon. Sorry to our brother. Soon, Lord, soon. 
fulfill all the things needed soon. May we have the glory to come. But we live in, in awe and wonder that we're alive unto God. The Spirit of God, God, the Holy Spirit is with us and for us. Now, we need to keep that awe at all costs. All costs. Be still and know that I am God, the Lord says. If we have to deal with the busyness of noisy children, all the busyness of life, but don't lose the awe of being a child of God, born again by the Spirit, by the gift and the grace and the pleasure of God in Jesus Christ. Don't lose that awe. That is who you are. And that is awesome and wonderful. And it's smiling. It's lovely. I love, it. I love a congregation that smiles and just laps it all up, as it were. But it's, isn't it wonderful? Ah, oh, I've gone back to page one. We will be a long time. Uh, so we're on to uh, the second thing. We live with God in awe. And this second point actually goes back to that a bit. In it's, it's, it doesn't lose that point. With responsibility. We live with the Holy Spirit with an enormous responsibility. We must apply ourselves vigorously to this enormous, glorious life that is so wonderful compared to the drudgery, that we must apply ourselves vigorously. We have a great responsibility. We're the light of the world, the salt of the earth, and we have to shine brightly. Oh, I feel like it always sometimes. We are going back a little bit, backtracking a little bit to that awe, sense of awe. We're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. That's the awe and the responsibility together. Wherefore, my beloved, Philippians 2.12, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. So when, when we're gone, in, in our absence, when you're all back home, it's just quiet, it's just you and your computer, or wherever you're at, wherever you're at, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Mm. You're not alone. Mm. You still have the Spirit dwelling with you and in you. For it is God, it's God which worketh in you. So the fear and trembling there is, it's God the Spirit working in you. Oh, what a responsibility, what an awe we have looking up to him, but what an awe that he is with us and in us. Work out that salvation. I've always understood that text as a great terms of assurance. Work out, for God's working in you. Are we okay then? And as a sort of a, a Calvinistic, strong Calvinistic doctrine. Oh, God's working in us, so we're okay. But I haven't had enough of a sense of the fear and trembling of it. The fear and trembling that God is working in us. The privilege is enormous. The awe is enormous. But the responsibility is also enormous. How is God working in the Christian? Not by a mere influence upon us. As the, maybe the Arminians, I don't know, is God sort of helping them along. But the indwelling of the Spirit, no doubt they would agree with that. Something. There is, that is the most fearful trembling matter, the indwelling of the Spirit in us. To be working out, living out our lives for Him. A great wonder. God the Holy Spirit is not only dwelling with man, but in man. Mankind for you ladies. John 14, 17, he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And as I maybe mentioned before, visiting an elderly man that was 90 and he was on his last years in a care home. He'd been dwelling on this point for some time. Mr. Fels, Brian Fels. Mm. And he's quietly in his chair and he says, I <laughs> looked up suddenly, he says, it's not only the spirit in us, it's the Spirit with us and in us. It's not one, it's both. He was rejoicing in his 90th. What a strength for a man in great weakness. Not only the Spirit in us, but with us. Well, this is a great responsibility and in some ways should utterly terrify us. In preparing this address, I was in great solemnity on this subject a, a, a while ago. I was thinking this is... This is too difficult 
too difficult. We should be like Peter in a sense that jumps off the boat, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. I can't have God living with me. I, I, I cannot, it's impossible. Yet, Jesus calls disciples, follow me, follow me. Encourages them along so gently. And in the next verses after that section in Luke, in fact, you get the way, you get the leper. Thou can make me clean. Oh, follow I He'll make me clean. I must follow him. I must follow him wholeheartedly. And so it is with us with the Spirit of God. Fearful. Yeah, we must. There's no alternative. This is the way. This is the way. Walk ye in it. Peace. Be still. The Lord has come to do us good. The terrifying almighty God upon us, with us, among us, in us. Yet to do us good, to love us, to change us, to glorify him, not to crush us. We're so ashamed, aren't we? That's why we have confession of sin, repentance. In our Book of Common Prayers, I remember that we pray for faith, repentance and the Holy Spirit. It's not just faith. It's not just repentance. It's the Holy Spirit. We cannot do these things without him. And he's come to make us rejoice to lift you up among princes he's come to take you for the walk to the green pastures beside the still waters up through the valley of the shadow of death mm. to the mountain meadows to feed you in green pastures oh come friends come and live with Jesus Christ mm. come and live with the spirit of God I, I, you relate this to everyday life well we need this time today, don't we? Mm. Furnish us to anoint our head with oil, cup that overflows. Mm. Yet we so often grieve the Spirit of God. Mm. We fail in our responsibility. The ordinary ways of life, you think, am I doing this for the glory of God? Yet the difficulty the difficulties, the challenges, the weakness, the impossibilities it itself show us that this is a miracle, that God is miraculously with us, for us. So we live with the Holy Spirit, with awe, but with responsibility. And thirdly, we live with the Holy Spirit desiring the fruit. Now we've spoken about that in the morning and evenings, and so I won't spend too much time on this at all, this the Christian has extraordinary fruit. There's an extraordinary life to be sought after and desired. Now the fruit, you can't get the fruit till you plant the tree. The tree, the fruit's off the branch, off the vine, and it's abiding in Christ. But we desire the fruit. The fruit is to the glory of God. And those things we've been looking at in the other little sections of these worship meetings in brief are to encourage us to desire the fruit. I've got some great fruit trees in my little garden. The garden's only about the size of this room and then we've got about uh, 12 planted so far and my wife says you won't get any more in there. <laughs> we will. Uh, uh, but the fruit, the peach tree. Oh, you would love a peach tree. Wouldn't you like a peach tree in your garden with little peaches? And they just start off their little things. They look like the tiniest thing. You know, it's never going to make it. Well, some of them have fallen off. But we've had three last year. More than the desire the fruit of the Spirit, though. That's the wonder. It's hard to believe that a harvest, a good harvest, could come out of a rotten soul like us. But by the Spirit of God, you'll be, you will be to the glory of God. Romans 8, 23 says that we're only the first fruits of the Spirit. We're still waiting, groaning for the promise full and blessed harvest to come. So don't be discouraged that your fruit looks a bit uh, small. There's great fruit to come. So desiring the fruit of the Spirit of God. And then we live, fourthly, with the Holy Spirit, with encouragement. Great encouragement. I've given you, you feel encouraged already, don't you, a bit? I can see that we, we have a great encouragement the awe, the responsibility, they the think, oh, I'm not that fruitful. <laughs> but encouraged, we're encouraged here. L listen to some of this here. 
Um, we're often discouraged, of course. The complete work of the Spirit is assured. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it mm. until the day of Jesus Christ. The work that has begun, that work that we so often inhibit and grieve, we'll get there. You'll get there. We've been speaking about this, haven't we, Some, somewhat of the... the the terrible difficulties, the ter that, or they're all part of it. That's part of what the Lord is using in chastening us and working in us to bring out these things here, to bring out the good things. The Spirit, Holy Spirit, prays for us. We're assured in, in I'm not turning all these verses too quickly, but in, in Romans 8 we'll see that we have trouble prayer. Pray, but the Spirit's interceding for us. So don't be discouraged to pray. You think, well, I can't pray. We, we can't pray. Let's just say we can't pray. God is too great. We don't know what we need. We can't understand our sin. How can we pray? The Spirit intercedes for us. We have great help in prayer. Great help in prayer. If only we start. If we start, you, you'll find that you will, you will get there. We, we're to continue in prayer. The Spirit will help us. We're, be encouraged in prayer. Don't be discouraged. We don't need signs. We have the reality. We have the Spirit of God. We don't need signs of the Spirit of God when we've got Christ in us because we've believed in him and turned to him. He's come to us. We know he is our God and our Saviour. We don't need healing. Thankful, thankful for your healing. <laughs> thankful, we're thankful for the healing, but we don't actually need them. We don't need tongue speaking, of course, because we have got the Spirit of God. I want to illustrate this encouragement with that chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, wonderful chapter. The letter of the law is, is good, but the Spirit, the Spirit is needed. And we see there, in 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians Chapter 3, verse 2. Ye are our epistle. These Corinthians, they weren't very good, were they? They were a terrible, terrible, terrible church. They were. Yet Paul says, ye are, ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, what, the Corinthians? Ministered by us. Written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. These people were filled with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. And what's more, they weren't only these people filled with the Spirit of God. Paul calls them our epistle. They didn't need letters of um, commendation, he says. Um, in, 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 in the first verse, sorry, I skipped the first verse. We don't need letters to commend us because we've got you. We've got you. You're our commendation. You are full of the Spirit of God. The Corinthians, be encouraged. If they were full of the Spirit of God, then how much more can people of God today with a better biblical understanding than the people of Corinth had be filled with the Spirit of God? Living proof that the Spirit is working in the people of God. I'm sure we haven't done some of the things that the Corinthians did. I'm not saying we're better than them. A tree is known by its fruits. A pastor is known, not for his likes on social media, <laughs> but by the holiness of his people. By the Spirit working in us all. In verse 5, Paul, as a pastor, writes, Our sufficiency is of God, who hath, made, who hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. The apostle and his band preached, but the ability was not due to their words, but the Holy Spirit working in them. That's what he gave the credit to and the glory to. He, he recognised the work of the Spirit in, in the people 
and the work of the Spirit in his ministry. It's the glory of God. It's God working. Be encouraged. Verse 8. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious or more glorious than that of the Old Testament? Here Paul is saying that this work of the Holy Spirit upon souls is even more glorious than the giving of the Ten Commandments. When Mount Sinai was on fire, the people were afraid. More glorious. Now verse 17 says that now the Lord is that Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in, the, as in a glass or a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We have here the most wonderful description of God's working in his people, looking unto Jesus Christ. They're changed as they look upon Jesus Christ. Uh, we, we're, we're right to pray for him to change us. But in a way, we just look to him. Mm. And there, this most wonderful chapter comes to its high point. Mm. Looking to Jesus Christ. Mm. Not trying to improve ourselves. Though we want to be better, don't we? We want to be godly and holy. But it's looking to Jesus Christ, the wonder of the one who gave us the Spirit, the, one, the wonder of the one who died for our sins, bearing all our sins. And now looking to him as exalted in, in glory and to come again and to take us and to be with him. And in the meanwhile, he's given us another comforter, the Spirit of God to be with us and in us. So we live with the Holy Spirit in awe, with this great responsibility, desiring the, the fruit of the Spirit and with great encouragement. And, and lastly, we, can, we live with the Spirit in prayer. So I think we've already indicated perhaps. We pray, of course, for that holiness, to be filled with the Spirit, to have the, the fruit of the to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit, to live to the glory of God. We pray, that's very much our prayer, isn't it? But also we pray for the Word to come in the Holy Ghost and in power. So in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14, Paul writes, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savour of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savour of Christ, in them that are saved and in them that perish. For to the one we are the savour of death unto death, and to the other the savour of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many who which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. And then in, in um, chapter 4, verse 3, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants, for Jesus' sake. Um, uh, some people are... A, a, a little bit um, you know, laid back. The, oh, we preach the savour of death unto death to some, and to some it's life unto life. I desire to preach for people to be saved, for them to love Christ, to turn, to repent, and to know him. We desire that the word comes with the Holy Ghost and with power, as it did to the Thessalonians. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. Charles Spurgeon was well known 
is still well known, mounting the steps of his pulpit at the Metropolitan Tabernacle, 15 steps, and as he mounted each one, knowing that his sermons will be published in the whole world, every word written down and published, every step is the way he said, I believe in the Holy Ghost. He didn't trust in his manuscript, in his preparations, which I'm sure he did prayerfully prepare his sermons with the aim of hitting the target, as it were. But he went up into the pulpit. I believe in the Holy Ghost. So I've tried to emphasize the presence of the Spirit of God. And I think I, fa I feel like I've failed here already. But this should be true of all Christians. I believe in the Holy Ghost. Mm. This is what we believe. We believe that we're not able to please God without him working in us. We, we, we cannot rejuvenate the old man. We need to put on Christ. Yes. We need to remind ourselves. We need to pray uh, as both indwelt and asking for the Holy Spirit. We need to drive out all rivals. And if these things will come to pass, the reformed doctrine of the Holy Spirit will be at work in us. It will be the same Holy Spirit, that gave the word. The disciples had that amazing promise from, from, the, from the Lord Jesus Christ in those chapters of the Gospel of John there that when the Spirit came, he would, they would remember all things and he would teach them all things. And that's how we've got the Bible, both the Gospels and the Epistles. The disciples were in no state, but when the Spirit came, they gave them the whole word. And then we've got it here in our scriptures. As Paul says in a different context, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. There's that piece of God at the beginning of Romans 5. And then he goes into the terrors and the troubles, and the waiting, and the hope, and the experience. And then that just that knowledge, yes, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. And the amazing gospel, beginning of the gospel of John, put like this, but as many as received him, to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Mm. So in all, how are we going to live another day mm. with this responsibility, with this desire? But I trust with much encouragement and with much prayer, the Lord be with you. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. I'm aware that, I've, that you may have got subjects on your mind and you may want to say, well, you haven't addressed this and you haven't addressed that. Well, that's a starter for you. Can we just pray? Let's just pray. Oh, our Father in heaven, Thou art in heaven and we are on earth and thou art mighty and, and we are weak and in thyself is every good thing and in ourselves is no good thing. Oh Lord, but thou hast blessed us with our Saviour Jesus Christ and thou hast poured out the Spirit of God upon us that we may know our sins and even though we don't know them fully we may look unto Christ and be saved. Mm. And in that, thou hast sent the blessed Holy Spirit, convicting us, convincing us, converting us, miraculously coming to dwell with us. And Lord, though we can't believe it of ourselves, the Holy Spirit is in us and with us. In Jesus Christ, 
And Lord, we're, we're in shock. We're in shock. We're in awe. Mm. That Christ would humble himself. Mm. That as, the, as Christ, in a sense, the Spirit has also humbled himself from, from glory to dwell in, in these rotten souls and bodies. So Lord, we 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 we, uh, we don't know what to do. Mm. Yeah, we feel this privilege, this wonder, this joy in believing, this love, this hope, mm. and uh, this peace with God. And yet, Lord, Thou would send us out into the world to preach the gospel to every creature, to speak a few words here and there. How do we live, Lord? We thank Thee that the responsibility comes with a great encouragement that God is working in us. Thou art for us. Thou art not against us. Thou dost love us. And Thou will keep us. And Thou will deliver us through every evil thing unto Thy heavenly kingdom. Oh, Lord, I don't mean to shout up to heaven. Thou can hear a quiet prayer. But we thank Thee that we can pray and seek Thee and wait upon Thee. And Lord, we're not mystics. We believe in the scriptures. We believe in the commandments of God. But we believe we're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And there's a glory to come. And that thou will keep us. And thou will not leave us nor forsake us. Oh Lord, we love thee. Help us to love thee more. Mm -hmm. Bless this church and continue with it, Lord, in the days ahead. Maybe a uh, grassroots work growing up in Ireland. Maybe there be, may there be many more around the country. People that know the Lord, because He dwells with us by the Spirit of God. In His precious name, O oh Lord, forgive us and revive us and keep us from sin. Keep us in the knowledge and love of Jesus Christ, our precious and most glorious Savior. In his holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing from Psalm 143. We're going to sing the second version on page 297, page 297, verses 6 to 8, and this section of the psalm begins with uh, a stretching of the hands uh, to the one who alone can help, to the one who understands, and you know, it uses the word moan, complaints, he describes a thirsting soul, longing after God, like a ground that is parched, needs rain to refresh it. In verse 7, he prays for prevailing prayer, like Jacob, not being satisfied till the blessing is received, to a quick answer. An immediate answer. The, the true believer wants God's blessing now. Not leaving it to another day. We're not like those who, who said to, to Paul, we will hear thee again on this matter. The true believer wants to know now. And then verse 8, because I trust in thee. O Lord, cause me to hear thy loving kindness free when morning doth appear. Cause me to know the way wherein my path should be. For why, my soul on high, I do lift up to thee. Psalm 143, the second version, verses 6 to 8, as we come to the Lord's table. And after we've sung this, I'm going to ask people to come uh, closer to sit on the uh, chairs. Don't worry about the children bringing them with you. And we'll come close to the Lord's table as we, as we partake uh, together. Psalm 143, the second version, and verses 6 
uh, 2.8. Let's stand to sing. I do stretch my hands to Sasha, if you will also come around to, we'll put um, we can bring the Lord's table to the, or to the table to the um, to the middle there. <laughs> 